Yeah, so we've heard a lot this morning and, um, and more generally in the workshop about um, network formation models. And um, I think all of them so far have been stochastic in nature. They're probabilistic models that generate networks according to some probability distribution. And you know, my um, quick and very subjective take of the very large literature on this topic is that um, such models you know, are powerful for a number of reasons. First of all, you, know, you can do statistics on them, you can do inference on them, et cetera. And it does seem empirically from a research perspective that one can um, find satisfyingly simple probabilistic models for network formation that give rise to structural properties that we frequently observe in actual network data. So you know, the canonical example being we see heavy tail degree distributions all the time and preferential attachment is sort of this a appealing, simple probabilistic model that generates that property. So there's, sort of, there's, there's success on that front. Um, much, uh, much smaller and much less known is the literature on network formation games, um, which you know I've worked a bit in, Matt has worked quite a bit in, and, and a few others. And um, the motivation for network formation games is the observation that despite the sort of appeal of these stochastic models, that in the end, certainly if you're talking about social networks, nobody really believes that people flip coins to decide who to connect to in social structures. Um, rather, it seems more accurate to say that you know, people are agents with free will and motivation and interests, and they join networks or form links because you know, even though it takes effort to do that in some sense, they get utility, they get some kind of benefit out of joining a network or at least forming these relationships. So you know, if you start taking this line of thought to its logical extreme, you get to game theory and, and to, the, to the literature on network formation games. Um, where you, know, you essentially posit that agents have a utility function in which there's some cost to them to form links to other agents, but upon doing so, they join a macroscopic network formed by all of the agents that gives them some individual benefit. Okay, so um, to give perhaps the, the standard simple example, the simplest network formation game or, or type of game would be one in which you can form links to other individuals in the population at some cost per link. Um, so that's sort of the negative part of your utility. But then when you the, the resulting network formed by all of the links gives you some benefit. And it might be a benefit that, let's say, depends abstractly on your position in the network. So your overall utility might be the negative of your edge expenditures and, and then also minus the sum of your shortest path distance to all the other parties in the network. So, you know, you don't want to spend too much on edges, but you want to be in the middle of the network where everybody's very close to you, okay? And I've worked a little bit in this literature. I find it very interesting. Um, it's much less, you know, so the good thing about it is I think there's something real about it. I think that it's, a, a, you know, it's, it's closer to talk in the language of utility theory and, and microeconomics. Um, about people's motivations than it is to imagine them you know, truly making random decisions about how they, they form links in a network. Empirically, though, um, it seems quite difficult to find simple network formation g games which give rise to natural looking network structures. So the, the running joke, which I think I've discussed with Ashish and his colleagues before, is that if you ask, like, what is the equilibrium of your typical network formation game? Well, depending on you know, the edge cost, it's either the empty network, it's the star, or it's the complete network. And this is kind of all you can get. Okay. So that, that's, you know, so I think there's a lot still to say there and it's early for the field, um, but that, you know, sort of deficit of the theory doesn't prevent one from trying experiments on human subjects and seeing what's hap what happens. And so that's what I'm going to describe here. So I'm going to describe to you behavioral experiments on a network formation game. This was done in the context of a series of human subject experiments that we've been doing at Penn in which we bring groups of about three dozen human subjects into a lab at a time and have them play games with each other for real compensation. Um, so these are essentially a, a sort of a behavioral instance of, of, of you know, behavioral game theory or economics um, over a network structure. Okay, so they're trying to perform, perform some collective, possibly competitive task on a network. Um, and. Uh, Throughout the vast majority of this series of experiments, those networks were exogenously imposed on the subjects. And I'm going to tell you about the one set of experiments we did where part of the game itself was forming a network. And unlike the example I gave you where the utility function said, well, 
you're going to pay something for edges and then you get some benefit based abstractly on your network position. Um, here we have a network formation game where the, the purpose of building the network is in order to solve some collective task. Okay, And you'll, you'll see what I mean by that as we go. Um, so let me first just quickly describe to you the predecessor experiments that, that, um, that uh, we did um, because it, it'll tell you what task the subjects are trying to solve. So what I want you to imagine is an experiment or a series of experiments, maybe a couple of minutes each, in which every subject sees their local view of some larger network um, of 36 subjects. Um, and in the initial experiments, these networks were exogenously chosen by us as experimenters and, and imposed on the subjects. And I'll show you what the networks looked like in a second. Um, but the, the task in question here, the game, is what's called biased voting. So I'm going to show you, sort of describe it via this screenshot. So this is what the, the GUI looked like for these particular experiments. Um, you are a subject whose vertex is clearly identified in the middle by this, this word you. So in, in, in all these experiments, you would see yourself in the middle. And we're showing you um, connections to all of your edges who are other subjects in the experiments. And we are also, in this particular um, experiment, showing you the edges between your neighbors. Okay, so this is what's sometimes called your ego network. You know who your connect your friends are. You know which pairs of your friends are connected with each other and which are not. And you don't know anything else about the network structure. Okay, and um, you can think of these experiments as a simple coordination game with a strategic twist. If you're familiar with the two-player game Battle of the Sexes. This is like a networked version of Battle of the Sexes. So here's, here's how the payoffs work. Um, the subjects have two minutes. All everybody has to do at each moment in the experiment is pick a color for their vertex, red or blue. You can change your color as many times as you want. It's asynchronous move. Um, and so if you were a subject in the experiments, you, know, you can change this from red to blue and back as many times as you want. And as your neighbors change their color, you would see that updated on this interface. Okay. And the payoffs go as follows. If within the two minutes allowed for each experiment, at some point in the two minutes, all 36 players are unanimously selecting blue or all 36 are unanimously selecting red, then everybody will be paid something. And I'll come back to what the something is in a second. Okay? If that condition doesn't hold, everybody gets absolutely nothing. Okay, so if 35 of us settle on red and only one of us is holding out for blue, everybody in the room gets nothing. Okay, so there is a very, very strong incentive towards unanimity, towards coordinating on one color or the other. Okay, the strategic twist though is that different subjects in the same experiment prefer convergence to one color over the other. So in this particular screenshot, this player is being told if we reach unanimity to blue, you will be paid $1.25. And if we reach unanimity to red, you will be paid 75 cents. And Ashish might be in the same experiment and have the opposite incentives or, or, or it might even not be symmetric payoffs. Okay? So the point is, is we all, to get any payoff, we have to reach unanimity, but we care about what color we reach unanimity to. And there's a, there's a strategic <coughs> tension. Yes? Um, can you say a little bit about what they believe about the graph they're embedded in? They know nothing about it. And did you elicit anything along those lines? Or? You mean, did we ask them what did you? What are they imagining? I, I mean, um, I don't know what they're imagining. It's in the context of an undergraduate class on network science. So they, you know, they're familiar with the language of networks. They've perhaps been exposed to preferential attachment and network formation games generally. Um, so they're not total civilians. But we haven't primed them in any way about what the network structures would, would look like. Okay. Uh, Michael, along those lines, yeah. um, <clears throat> so the individual sort of first person perspective here, they have so many neighbors, of course all their neighbors could be blue and they could be blue, there still could be a red person out there that they can't see. That's correct. Right. Okay. That's right. Are they, are, they, are, you, are they notified there's a red person out there? No, all, but they do know that if at any point in, you know, in, any point in the experiment there's a, a unanimous choice, the system will freeze and everybody's payoffs oh, will be lost. So basically, as long as it's going on, you know there's not unanimity. And that's, that's all you would know other than what additionally you could infer, by, infer from your network's neighborhood. Okay? Okay, so everybody understand the, um, the setup here? Okay? Um, and so, by the way, these, uh, I won't go into exactly why, but you might, if some of you that remember it might be able to, to remember, um, we, 
we were sub we were loosely inspired in these experiments by the um, 2008 Democratic primary between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Um, uh, but but so basically, in order for any of us to get payoff, one side or the other, one type, by which I mean whether you have a higher payoff for red or a higher payoff payoff for blue, one one side or the other has to acquiesce and accept their lower payoff. Okay, and so. If you're designing an experiment like this and, and you're picking the networks that the subjects are going to play over, as we did in the, the first experiments I'm going to very briefly describe to you, the interesting you know, choices are, well, what network structures? And also, how do I arrange the two types of players, red preferring versus blue preferring, within the network? Okay? And again, because it's not the focus of this particular presentation, I don't want to say a lot about it. But this is basically showing you samples of the types of networks we gave them. Um, uh, these are all in pairs, so this network is exactly the same as this network, and I'm just showing you two different layouts, one of which highlights the separation between the two types, and the other one is the more standard layout, which tries to generate things with high degree towards the middle and lower degree vertices at the periphery. Um, but, you know, these are all networks over here in which we've divided the population into two equal sized populations of red and blue. Um, and then you can play around with the inter versus intragroup connectivity. So you can kind of create clustered models where you have a red cluster and a blue cluster, and most of the edges go within the clusters. Um, and then, of course, you can also do the opposite, um, where most players um, have edges that go to the other cluster. And you, know, you can actually create such a network that easily makes everyone perceive as if they're in the minority, even though, of course, um, there's an equal number of participants of both types. Um, of course, they would only have to perceive that through the color choices of their neighbors, which might be changing as they try to reach convergence to one color versus the other. But one comment I will make is that in all of these experiments, it is a ritual fact that at the very first seconds of the experiment, everybody enters choosing their higher payoff color. Okay? Um, so, so you do, you, you know, I think people did get some very, very good sense of at least the color choices, the, the preferences of their neighbors in the early seconds of the experiment. Okay, <clears throat> and then these are all networks in which there's um, a very large majority for red. Let's say in this one, um, there's 30 that prefer red and only six that prefer blue. Um, but they, the networks were generated according to preferential attachment, and the, the small minority that prefers red are the highest degree vertices. Okay, so you can view these experiments um, as a test of whether a small but well-connected minority can systematically impose their preference um, on, on the majority against the greater social welfare, right? Because the max social welfare solution here would be everybody playing blue so that the highest number of players get their preferred choice. Okay? So you can, you know, so the, this is sort of the perverse little kinds of things we've been doing to, to pen undergraduates for the last six or seven years or so. And um, again, I want to quickly get onto the network formation version of this task. Um, but, but, you know, the bottom line is th this is a fairly challenging task and we're deliberately choosing networks which are highlighting this tension between the two sides, right? Um, and, and subjects do well at this task, right? So in the 81 experiments that we gave them, you know, they didn't take anything, I guess we only allowed a minute, not two minutes, but um, they, they, you know, converged on, on the vast majority of experiments to unanimity to one color or the other. Interesting side comment. The success rate was much, much higher on these minority power experiments, where of uh, the 27 that we did um, were of that form, 24 of them actually reached unanimity, always to the minority preference. Um, okay, so this was the this is the task, um, and um, you know, it, it it had always bothered me in this line of experimentation that we. Um, you know, there are many, many artificial things about these experiments. Okay, They're, these are highly stylized experiments. You know, we're taking real human beings and kind of forcing them into these settings where they can only exhibit kind of insect-like um, behavior. Um, so there are many, there are many, there are many um, things that are artificial about the experiments. But the one that always bothered me the most was this fact that we were exogenously picking the network structures and imposing them on the subjects. Because after all, you know, real networks sort of don't, don't form that way. And you can, of course, do all kinds of interesting things in the lab that way, like these minority power experiments. But I always sort of thought, like, well, it would be more interesting if 
building the network was part of the task itself, that you sort of need to build the network in service of the problem you're being asked to solve. And you know, there's this sort of small strand of literature in organizational behavior and other areas that, that basically suggests that, that that's what people, you know, that, that people perform better as groups if you let them build their own networks and that they'll sometimes even, you know, circumvent whatever network you try to impose on them in order to make the organization work more efficiently. So, you know, um, there, there was a period back in the dot-com boom where um, you know, consulting firms like McKinsey were making a fortune going around to organizations and saying like, well, you know, here's the org chart you showed me and here's how people really interact in your organization and work gets done and, you know, invariably in Malcolm Gladwell-like fashion, there's some low-level, you know, secretary in the, in the organization who's, you know, infinitely more important than the CEO, this, this kind of, you know, um, this sort of story. So I was sort of interested in, in, you know, whether that's true or not, whether letting people build the network, um, knowing what the task was, was a helpful thing or not. Um, and I kind of suspected it would be, and I wanted to test it, and so I decided, well, let's test it in the context of this, this biased voting game. Uh, what did I do there? Okay, so, th so we did a later set of experiments on L admittedly a different set of subjects, because it was a couple of years later, um, and so you're seeing a very similar interface here. Um, but in this, in, in, now in this game, the, the building of the network itself is part of the task. So what I mean by that is that at the beginning of each little one-minute experiment, the network consisted of 36 isolates, 36 vertices with no connections to any other human subject. Okay? And then, as per the interface here, um, anybody who wants to at any time in the experiment can purchase an edge for, in this case, three cents. Okay? And your edge purchases would be deducted from any earnings that you made in the experiment. So if you, for instance, as it says in this experiment, would be paid $3 for reaching unanimity to red, and you, in fact, if the population did reach unanimity to red, you would be paid $3 minus your edge expenditures. If unanimity wasn't reached in an experiment, in, the, in the, these versions of the experiments, all edge expenditures were forgiven. So you couldn't, I'm, I'm actually not even sure that IRB um, uh, approval would allow you know subjects to have a, have to pay me after participating in an experiment. So so you know if they didn't if they didn't solve the problem, nobody had to pay anything for the edges. But in the case that you you did, you would you would have to have it deducted. Yeah. Can I ask a design choice question? It yeah. seems from this. Um, yeah. So like we we know our preferences, and then if you're blue and I'm red, like we're playing this adversarial game of trying to get the upper hand by forming the graph, possibly in real time. Did you do a version of this where I didn't know my preferences? Like, I know I'm going to interact in the community. I don't know if I'm going to have preferences for red or blue and what the... Haven't tried that. Okay. Haven't tried that. And remember, you only know the preferences of other parties from whatever you can glean through their color choices. I see. So this is... I'm... I'm I see. So types are unknown. The only, the only thing you can observe is behavior. You don't really know... And sure. you might infer behavior sure. By, sure. By, by noting that this person played red at the beginning. Right. And you know, but you don't know for sure. You know, maybe maybe they maybe they were acquiescing. Yeah. The conservation of links. So if I had a tie, I have to then be forced to drop one. Or no, just... no. Okay. So um, so and furthermore, um, edges are bilateral. So if I buy an edge to you, I pay for it, but you get the benefit of it in that you can now see what I'm doing too. So just I'll, so let me just go a little bit further here. So at the beginning of the experiment, right, you would see you in the middle here with no connections whatsoever. Okay. And then as the experiment uh, progresses and you buy edges and other buy edges, the, the, the interface part of this was difficult to design. But so you would have a dynamic layout and what would happen is if you, add, if you added a new edge, and I'm, I haven't yet said how you choose who you add an edge to, um, what would happen is a new, ver you know, sort of a new vertex would appear at sort of the periphery of your diagram with a link to you and then there would be kind of a um, you know, kind of a tension model readjustment of the layout to show you what your new neighborhood looked like, okay? Um, okay, um, we also made sure that the number of edges you were allowed to buy um, made it so that you couldn't actually ever have zero payoff for your less preferred color, okay? We didn't want subjects to get to a point where their edge expenditures caused, let's say, their post-expenditure payoff for blue to actually be zero. 
Because at that point, you know, rationally, you should be infinitely stubborn and just hold out for your higher color because you're indifferent. So the number of edges you could purchase, and we played around with the edge cost too, but whatever the edge cost was, we made sure that you had a non-zero payoff even for your less preferred color post expenditures. Okay? Okay. Now, of course, the crucial design question here, to which I don't claim that this is the right answer out of many, many that you could imagine, is if you say, I want to add another, I want to buy another link, you know, what information, if any, should you have about what the destination of that link is? Because you don't have individual identity of the other, of the other subjects in the room, right? And, you know, we could give meaningless labels and you could say, well, link me to Vertex 17, but that doesn't seem very satisfying. The system could just decide random to pick a random, but then that would seem to bake in kind of an Erdős Renyi-like structure. So we wanted to give a design that seemed to provide some simple information that might be useful for the task in question, okay? So basically, what you, that, that's what's going on in this new element of the interface down here. So all of the people that are currently your neighbors are represented in the central part of the diagram. Every vertex that's, that, you are, that is not a neighbor of you is represented by a circle down in this grid over here. And that circle is telling you what the current degree of that vertex is and what their current shortest path distance to you is. Okay, and if there's a, if, you know, so here, for instance, is a, is a vertex you're not connected to that's three hops away from you and happens to have degree three also. And a star inside means there's just more than one vertex with those, those, that pair of values. Okay, so if you want to buy a new edge, you come over here and click and say like, well, you know, maybe what I want, I might say like, well, I want to click on this vertex because they have a very high degree and maybe they're aggregating information elsewhere in the network that would be useful for me to see. Or maybe I want to click on a low degree vertex because I'll be able to influence them more. So I might buy edges imagining that I'll gain information. I might buy edges because I want to influence. And I might use the distance information to decide, you know, whether I want to see things closer or further from my own current neighborhood. Yes? These, yes, that's right. These are the degrees. So, so we're also telling you what the current degrees of your neighbors are. So this, by the way, this is sort of our model for the maximum you might be reasonably expected to know about your social network, who your friends are, which pairs of them are friends with each other, and maybe some crude information about which of your friends are relatively more or less popular, so to speak. Okay? But, but it's interesting that you don't know the blue or red state of the people you're attaching to. Um, you mean over here? Yeah. Yeah, that would give you global information, right? We, we wanted to preserve the locality of information about, about color choices and decisions. Um, and then we wanted to give you some crude topological information about vertices you're not connected to. Otherwise, you'd have, otherwise in some sense, if you put colors over here, everybody would have a, a global view, and it, the network aspect of it really goes away. OK? OK, let me trundle forward here. Okay, so I think I said most of this. So I mean, this is a very complicated game, right? I mean, it is a asynchronous move, multi-stage game of partial information. Um, even analyzing watered-down versions of this theoretically it seems like a hopeless task to me. Um, but you can sort of identify what the strategic tensions are in edge purchases. I mean, I mean, first of all, at a minimum, it would seem that collectively we would need to purchase a spanning tree in order to be able to solve this problem. Because otherwise, if we have you know, two disconnected components, the chance of being able to unanimously coordinate seems low. Okay? So there's a sort of a minimum density we need. Of course, every one of us would prefer that everybody else purchase that spanning tree and we get to use it for free. Um, so, you know, one question is, should I buy edges or not? What should I buy for information or, or influence? Should I do it early in the game or late in the game to hire low degree players, near or far? Okay, um, so what happened? Um, so, uh, I'm run, running short on time. Basically, they did terribly at this task, okay? And of all of the, of all of the experiments that we did over six years on many, many different tasks, including biased voting, where we were giving them exogenously chosen networks, often perversely chosen to be what we perceived to be difficult for the task in question, um, this was by far and away the lowest success rate. So 
um, one measure of this that you can use to just kind of measure collective performance over all the experiments, tasks, networks we've run over the years is sort of social welfare, right? I can uh, post hoc, I know every network I gave the subjects, I know what the incentives were, and I can compute for every little experiment I've ever done what would have been the max social welfare solution? What would have been the configuration of play by the subjects which would have cost me the most in subject payments? And I can sum all those up, put it in the denominator, and in the numerator I can sum up all of their actual payments. That ratio, excluding these experiments, is close to 90%. So of everything we've ever tried, they've left just a little bit more than 10% of the available money on the table. Here, their success rate was, you know, depending on the session in question, either, you know, was below 50% and in some cases as low as 38%. And there's additional details I'm not giving you here, including in some of the networks, rather than starting off with the empty network, we started with a seed network, which gave them some basic structure for free. And then they could additionally add edges to that structure. But in the interest of time, let me not go into that and say, you know, they didn't do well at this task. They did much, much more poorly than anything we'd given them. So we would kind of, you know, for the first time, allowed them to control the structure of the network. They understood the task well. And we allowed them to control the structure of the network within the confines of the interface and information that I described to you and try to build a network in service of, the, of, of performing the task well. And not only did they do terribly relative to everything we've tried before, they did terribly relative to the same task on networks that we gave them um, exogenously. Okay, so, you know, I was surprised at this outcome. I found this kind of disturbing and at odds with what I expected. And there's at least two, there's at least two plausible explanations or hypotheses for why they did that. One is what I would call overload, and the other one is what I would call stubbornness. Overload is just like, well, maybe they can build good networks for this task, but in one minute, having to build the network simultaneously while you're trying to solve this coordination task, maybe it's just too much to do in too short a time, and if we'd given them longer or let them build the network first and then try to solve the problem on that network after, maybe it would have been better. The other one is what I would call stubbornness. Um, maybe, maybe they built perfectly good networks for solving the task, but post the incentives, the players who'd spent the most on edge purchases and therefore had reduced their lower payoff to a low level, maybe they were just, you know, um, I'm holding out for my higher color, and it changes their behavior, right, because their incentives have been modified by the network. And you could easily imagine yourself think, sitting there thinking like, well, you know, I bought a lot of edges, my lower payoff is pretty low now, so I don't mind walking away from that. And furthermore, I deserve my higher payoff because I built all this infrastructure that we're using to coordinate on. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, what, what was the number, like, were there a lot of um, players buying edges? I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to exactly that at, um, in just a second. Okay. So, um, hey, Mike, a quick question. Have the, the students who were building the networks, have they previously played the game with the free for the Given network? No, no. This is a fresh batch of subjects. However, your question is a nice segue to a third session that we ran on a fresh set of human subjects that tried to test whether either of these two hypotheses were true about overload or stubbornness. So this is sort of a schematic of this third session design. So in the first two sessions, actually, um, you know, the picture is you start off with no edges. Everybody's an isolate. And the, the colors here are sort of showing you the relative payoffs for the two colors. So this is a player that gets a higher payoff for blue. This is a player that gets a higher payoff for red. This is not data. This is just a schematic, OK? So then they play the game and they build the network. Maybe they do or maybe they don't reach unanimity. But now you have some network structure. And now the incentives have been changed, right? The rel these are sort of showing relative payoffs, right? So now everybody's incentives are changed. And so here's a player, for instance, who bought a lot on, for a, a lot of edges. So their, pay, their relative payoff for blue is now very tiny compared to their payoff for red. Okay, so to test the um, to test the overload hypothesis, what we can do is we can now take this network as a fixed exogenous network and give it to a fresh set of subjects, just like in the original biased voting experiments. But now this is we're going to give them networks created by human subjects. Okay, and that network may or may not have led to a successful outcome. 
Um, so, Some so of those were successful. Some so, we generally did what I'm about to describe to you using the networks that were hardest for the subjects and on which they had failed in these earlier sessions. Okay. So, if I want to test the overload hypothesis, you know, I can take a network built by the subjects in the sessions I've described to you so far, and I can now restore the original incentives onto this built network. Okay. And so now, this is just like the original biased voting experiments. It just happens to be on a network generated by a prior set of human subjects. Okay? Um, if I want to test the overload hypothesis, right, I can just take this actual configuration down here as my exogenous network, preserving the post-play incentives of the earlier group. So everybody get what's going on? right? So if it's the case that they, in other words, if it's the case that they were building good networks for the task, but they just couldn't solve it because of the overload problem, then subjects should do well, the new subjects should do well in this configuration. And if they were building good networks here, but the problem was just that people like this have now become very stubborn and made it hard to reach unanimity, then subjects should do well over here. Yeah, I know I'm out of time. Um, I'm to, or organizers, okay. prerogative, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, um, but I'm, I'm going I'm to. I, I won't be much longer. Okay. No, actually, it's fine. We, lunch is late, and we have a, we have a okay. session anyway. And if you don't go through your slides, people are going to ask you questions. Okay. Um, you all right. Have, so, so um, I, I, but I won't be too much longer. Okay. So everybody understand the setup. So this is what we did in this third session. In this third session, there's no network formation element at all. It's just like back in these original experiments, and just they just don't know that the networks they happen to be playing on, rather than being generated according to preferential attachment, have it happen to have been generated according to a previous set of human subjects. Okay. Um, so the answer is they did even worse. Okay. <laughs> So now the subjects don't have anything to worry about except reaching coordination and reaching unanimity in this coordination game. And in this final session, basically, you know, we went down to about 41% success rate, okay? Um, down from a little bit below 50 to now down by 4. So it, it, it seems that the conclusion is that, you know, we gave human subjects the ability to control the structure of their network within some reasonable parameters and sort of information view in service of a particular task and letting them build the net by letting them build the network they proceeded to build networks lousy for solving the task on which solving this coordination problem seems to be difficult even for a fresh set of subjects that have nothing to worry about other than playing on the given network okay now, you know, you might ask why. What is it about these networks that was hard or how do these no you know, or even just more basically how did the networks look similar or different to the naturally occurring networks? Um, you know, so you can measure things like clustering coefficient degree distribution. And in the interest of time, let me not say a lot there. But other than you know, there there do seem to be traces of these commonly occurring properties in these artificially built networks, including high clustering coefficients, heavy tail degree distributions. But getting back to your question, you know, what did the edge purchases look like? So one telling fact is that there was a large amount of free riding, okay? So a very small fraction of the participants purchased the vast majority of the edges. So these three curves are, correspond to different cost of edges, right? High, medium, or low edge costs. But what I'm doing is I'm ordering the subjects in a given experiment um, or, or, or across all of the ex uh, experiments by how many edge expenditures they made, so sort of from lowest to highest. And I'm saying what fraction of the total edge expenditures were made by what fraction of the population. So you can see at 50% of the population here, um, we're down at near or below 10% of the edges. So fully half of the population is hardly buying any of the edges at all. And if you want to get up to 50% of the edge expenditures, you need to take about 80% of the population or more. So there, it does seem that, that a very small number of people have, have done all the bulk of the edge purchasing on average. And this, of course, is related to having a, a, a heavy tail degree distribution. And, um, and you might imagine how this influence is played. Now, we, we spent some time trying to look for, you know, figure out what structural properties about the networks they build seem to make this coordination task hard. By the way, you know, there, there was no problem with connectivity. Right? Even under the high 
even under the high edge costs experiments, um, there was it was the, the networks were always connected and 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 you know they were sparser you know ra rationally they're sparser the more you charge for edges but there was there was enough connectivity there you definitely had more than a spanning tree and you had fairly cyclical graphs in fact here and this is my last slide here is a visualization of three actual networks built by the subjects under high edge costs right so um, you know they're they're relatively sparse networks. But you can see the preponderance of these individuals with very high degree, who probably are also the ones who, you know, it's unlikely that it happened to be the case that everybody else purchases edge to, to them. That would be a bit difficult in the interface. So perhaps not all, but many of the edges that you see emanating from these hubs were likely purchased by the hub itself, okay? So you do have these heavy tail degree distributions. You know, if you ask, well, what's different about a network like this? than let's say a preferential attachment network with a comparable edge density. Um, it's sort of the over-reliance, it's not just the presence of these connectors, but an over-reliance on the, these connectors. So what, e what this column is showing you is this same network in each case with the, um, with the highest degree vertex deleted from the network, just deleting a single vertex, okay? And you can see that in all these three networks, deleting just the single high degree vertex immediately breaks the, shatters the network into many, many connected components, including a, a large number of isolates, okay? So, you know, it, it's hard to know behaviorally um, uh, in, in hindsight what people were doing, but it does seem if you compare this to other sort of natural structural models like preferential attachment, you know, it, this, this wouldn't happen in a preferential attachment network of the same density. If you would, you know, eventually, of course, you would, if you remove, and this, by the way, is removing the two highest degree nodes, right? So it really seemed that population-wise, there just for sort of communication purposes, there are many, many parts of the network or even individuals that really only had one source of connectivity. And if you're counting on that individual to do information aggregation, you just may be out of luck if they're stubborn. Okay? So let me stop there and we can maybe just um, continue into the panel. So uh, this, uh...